Yes. Hello, and thank you for falling for the buzzwords. <laughs> Uh, I promise you this talk isn't that buzzword oriented though. Um, I'm talking today about an experience I had implementing um, a yeah, fairly large microservices application, a group of microservices in uh, Skottetarten in Norway, um, where we migrated from an existing system that had scaling issues and that had also issues of uh, discovering errors made in the past, which led to the decision um, to, to porting it over to using event sourcing and, and distributed services. So the reason I made this talk, or the reason I wanted to go out uh, to conference with the talk, is that I, when I originally started, didn't know much about microservices. And I watched a lot of presentations about them. And I feel that microservices and event sourcing are often used in contexts where you have a lot of degrees of freedom, where you can send messages with eventual consistency, you can lose messages, you don't have exactly once delivery. And all these choices make perfect sense if you have a different application. As you can imagine, at, at uh, the tax authority, uh, not only Norway, I guess any tax authority, uh, we want to be exact. We don't want to send out a tax note that says, this is approximately the tax you have to pay. We want to have exactly all information in place. We want to know that everything's processed. And looking in the landscape of existing uh, office, uh, we didn't really find anything that, that uh, fulfilled this need. And as a consequence, we build our own small framework, and it's really not a big framework, it's a few few hundred classes maybe, um, that uh, organize uh, events for us, and then the big idea behind it is basically what I want to talk about it, what, what we uh, had to put in place to make everything work, right? So the idea is I start with the concept and um, explain what event sourcing uh, means uh, in general and how we interpret it. Um, there's, there's obviously many uh, ways of doing event sourcing, and I'll, I'll talk about our way of doing it and how it differs from how most people are doing it. Then I'll hopefully have some time to talk about the implementation and the operation. I only have 45 minutes, so we'll just see how it goes, and I guess I'll just take it on the way. Right? So event sourcing in itself isn't so hard, basically, and I guess many of you have heard of it. It's been quite around uh, the last years. So, and, and, and I think most applications are already event-oriented, because think of a bank, and this is the classical event sourcing uh, example. Uh, one out of three talks has exactly this example, but it works really well um, to, to um, describe the, the system behind it. So think of a bank, uh, and you credit uh, money on the account, then you probably have a log statement somewhere that says what has happened. The idea of event sourcing, basically, is to take these events that we just log out and make them structured in a way that we can reuse them in the future, that we don't have just a, a file with a lot of text in it, but that we have a more structured way of uh, remembering um, what has happened and to basically apply these changes um, once we discover them. Right? So in a normal application, you credit and debit money, and every line in the log will tell you what has happened. And this is how we debug production applications often. That's going to go in, in Logstash or in Splunk. And uh, that way, we can uh, discover what has happened, hopefully. Uh, another way of um, persisting old state is uh, auditing. And if you have used a framework like Hibernate, you can just enable that more or less. Uh, Envis, if you've heard of that, where every time we update a table, we copy the old state of the table to an audit table. And this information you can then either access um, programmatically and expose it, or you can just go in the database and check what has happened. And this is also a way of tracing old state. This is maybe if a log isn't um, uh, complex enough to, to understand what has happened, audit tables can really help you to understand what has happened in the application, right? Mm, event sourcing is taking these two ideas and uh, is basically taking it just one step further. In event-sourced application, the big idea is that instead of writing a log after things have happened, you generate a log of things that have happened, and then you apply these changes to a table that is basically representing the current state. So if you credit 100 uh, krona, you basically create an event in, in some persistent format that says, this account has uh, received 100 crowns. Then you have a process of these events that is copying the state to a snapshot table and then basically saying, all right, you have uh, credited 100 crowns. Before you had zero crowns. As a result, now you have 100 crowns. Uh. And you're walking through several events like that, and every time something happens, you update the snapshot table, right? So what's the big uh, deal of that? Why, why is this so useful? 
The very useful property of that is that you can just reset the snapshot table. So before, when you were asked, for example, why did this person receive funds on that day and had this amount of money on this account, um, then you would go through a log file. You would, like, if there's an error, you would have tried to find out what has happened by reconstructing what was done in the production system, right? And then you have logs, hopefully. You have maybe audit tables that capture old state. But with event source apps, you have all events, and you can just replay them. So you can just reset the snapshot. And if you know that this event was uh, applied yesterday, and the question is, why was this state observed yesterday, then you can just replay the events uh, in some, some test environment and recreate all behavior that the production environment has displayed um, to see where uh, something went wrong, right? And in theory, this is, is a great property. This is also what we were after when we first implemented um, event sourcing. We wanted to do, um, in Scott the Tartan, obviously, we have very complex um, changes to, to the state that we observe for people. I guess in Sweden, it's very similar to Norway. In, in Norway, uh, everything is collected automatically. Banks report in status. Uh, if you move, this is automatically registered and updated. And um, a lot of things play a role when you pay taxes, obviously. How many kids you have, how many, um, if you're married, if you're not married, uh, if you own businesses, if you have a business and you're, you're the CEO of it, right? And all this information we need to kind of uh, keep track of. And when we compute taxes, then not the current state is relevant, but an old state is relevant. If we compute taxes now for last year, then the amount of children you had last year play a role if you had a new child in January that doesn't really apply to the tax report you get for 2018. So because of this property, we found this was the ideal way of doing it. And a part of my talk today is why um, this isn't so easy as it seems like. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah, I basically, one important distinction um, we have to make is, and this is something I confused, was confused about in the beginning, um, the difference between events and commands. If you look at this example here, then it looks like all commands that come from the outside, like someone going into a online banking, for example, and saying, I want to debit 200 crowns, will result in an event. But obviously, um, commands can be rejected. Events are things that have happened and that are basically done. Events are never changed, events are never reverted, events are at maximum corrected. While commands are basically latent um, instructions to change the state, to generate an event. So for example, if your uh, credit is overrun, you want to debit 200 crowns, but you only have 150 crowns in your account, then you can maybe generate an overrun event and not debit 200 crowns, and then you can extract um, information about this. For example, if someone tries to overrun an account many times, you will have these events. Maybe you're not doing anything with them now, but in the future you want to implement a system that detects fraud, and then if someone tries to overrun an account a lot, then this is maybe an indicator uh, that you can use. But in the end, it's, it's up to you how you map commands to events. Right. So. Um, another important concept to know uh, of and just to have the term right is CQRS that's mentioned a lot in the uh, context of event sourcing. And CQRS is meaning exactly what I just said. Uh, you segregate the idea of sending commands, which are basically requests for, for changing state, and uh, reading events. Reading events should never have a side effect. Reading events is basically just observing what has happened. Commands are sent to the system and trigger changes that then generate events. And um, don't really, if you send a command, you don't expect an answer. You just want to say, do this. And then on the other side, once you said, um, extract money from my account, you listen to events that come back and said, like, what has happened? And it doesn't necessarily mean asynchronicity. You can do this run synchronously. Um, but typically, it is uh, asynchronous which obviously is a challenge for many people. But keeping these uh, things separated, uh, I mean, CQS is basically the old term, which means it for classes, that a, cl a method in a class should either return a value or change state and not return a value. And basically, this concept ex expanded to this architectural model is CQRS, right? So um, just that before I can talk about the application we built, I want to quickly talk about the domain of the application. What, what are we doing? Uh, the system we built sounds fairly trivial. Uh, in in uh, Skattetaten, we have the, the need to know who pays taxes. 
and the entirety of the tax authority is supposed to have the same picture of who's paying taxes. And who's paying taxes? Obviously, people pay taxes and um, companies pay taxes. And it would be that easy, but it is not. Because if, when I came to Norway, I'm Germany originally, I registered with my passport. So I became a taxpayer by this identification information. Um, when I was in Norway for a while, I got a so-called D number, a uh, foreigner ID, uh, which again identified me. And then after another while, I got a citizen ID because uh, I was there for more than half a year and then you basically get the real number, not the temporary one. All these three IDs are IDs that I can use when I file information that are tax relevant, right? But Scott the Tartan needs to know that I'm the same person. And it gets even more complicated because I can register a company, I can have a company abroad, I can own this company and I can be employed by this company and my company, uh, I can... I relate to other people, I have children, I have uh, a Sambur, and uh, I can have a company that buys more companies. And all this information needs to be basically represent me as a taxpayer. Uh, and the application we built is basically crawling all the registers that contain information about me uh, as a person, as a business owner, and tries to consolidate me as a, as a single taxpaying entity. So what we do is that we have all these registers in Norway that are keeping uh, information about people and companies. We have the Folke Register, which is storing information about all people. We have the Enhas Register, which is storing information about all people. We have um, uh, Toll, like uh, if you go via customs, uh, then you will be registered. If you, for example, five years ago came to Norway and you brought alcohol, uh, you will be registered, and this passport ID will already identify you as a taxpayer in Norway because you have to pay customs taxes, right? And then obviously we have um, manually registered companies. If, if um, something is not an automated register, then people just punch it in um, and it will also end up in our system. Before, we had one big monolith that basically received information from all kinds of systems and processed them. Right? And that ended uh, to, in the end, as things jammed up a lot because, for example, and if two cities were re-registered, to have a different um, commune number, uh, which is basically a city city number, and then Folke Register was spinning out information for for weeks, um, and and the system was very slow to react. That was not a great system to to deal with if you're also punching stuff into a computer parallelly, right? So how we redesign is that all these registers now publish their information to an event store, and then this event store is basically processed by applications. And we started out uh, very, very uh, small. In the beginning, um, obviously, we couldn't migrate the whole system at once, so we just wrote one um, small service that basically took all events that came in and uh, processed them to generate tax IDs, and nothing more. You couldn't look up an address, you couldn't look up a name, nothing. Just um, IDs for people and, and uh, companies. And this is where we uh, basically changed uh, or did something very differently to most event sourced applications. Most event sourced applications would take commands in, change the state as they receive events from, or like commands from the outside, and then publish the result back to the event store. What we did is that we receive information from the outside, we then persist these commands as events in the event store and the applications uh, that come uh, re basically read this information write their result back to the event store as well. So basically everything is an event in our space, and for us as an um, entity that needs to have very exact information about what happened, this really uh, makes, makes debugging today super easy for us. We also synchronize things to the legacy register, which is still online, and one big advantage we saw also in event sourcing was that after the system was already running for, for weeks and months, we could constantly publish new services that could just reread all the events that have come in over the last weeks and uh, reprocess them to go online when they were ready. And now we have a bunch of services online, like we can look up stuff, we can search for people uh, and companies, we can look into relationships, which is published in a graph database to um, connect people, well, and actually not long in a graph database, but in the beginning. And we also can uh, create exporting services, right? 
And this all sounds really great, right? Um, it did for us, but over the, the years uh, that we run the project, we discovered a few deficiencies as well. Uh, the problem is with event sourcing, and basically what I mentioned as an advantage now is that it promises you that you can easily change snapshot representations. You only have events, right? So when you want to go from a graph database as we did to another representation format, then you can just do this. You take the old service offline, you just scrap it and, and remove it, and then you publish a new service that has the new technology in it. It's completely rewritten. You don't have to care about legacy data representations, and you just reprocess all events and um, there you go. The problem is that if you have not future-proven your event capture in the beginning to reflect these new use cases in the future, then it's actually harder to introduce these services as it would have been without event sourcing. Because the decision you make in the beginning about how your events are captured and represented basically affects and influences the entire application uh, and uh, the entire landscape of applications around this event store for the ent entirety of, of everything, right? So we have very quickly understood that we sometimes forgot uh, trivial things that we haven't needed because we had this advantage, right? We just can put it into production, we process the events later. Then a year in, we realized that we missed this one single thing um, uh, and we cannot represent it, right? Mm. And this is the, the base reason why we chose to persist all commands from the outside. Everything that comes in, every re web request is basically dumped in the event store in its entirety uh, and then processed into a so-called rich event in our terminology a bit, uh, which is then a, a consequence, something that actually has happened, right? Uh, also, event sourcing is making snapshots redundant by replaying events, as I showed you with the bank, right? In theory, that is the, the case, and, and the, the reality, though, is that every time you change your code, the event processing will change. If you have millions of events that you replay in a chain and you just make a tiny change somewhere, then maybe after 10 events, you go down a different route, which affects everything. So you deploy a new version into production, you replay a snapshot, and you get an entirely different result, despite the event store which is uh, breaking the promise of event sourcing. So it's not that easy. You still have code that processes events to create snapshots, and as long as this code is mutable uh, and the results can change, uh, the, the idea of event sourcing is broken. So you still have to be super careful, obviously, also with event sourcing uh, with what you create. Yeah, uh, also the idea that you can debug everything and you can understand everything that uh, is going on in your application because you have captured events of everything that was done uh, is the same, it's the same as with logs. You can always argue that your logs capture everything that is happening in the application, but in, in reality, you often miss some bits between uh, stages in your, in your microservices app that you haven't captured, and then you won't understand it either, right? Because between you get a command and you create an event, there's a lot that can happen, right? And if you forget just to check something, and, you, and we at least capture the commands now, then you, you won't be able to, to understand anything. Yeah, also the debugging part, right, um, is, is, is harder than it seems like because um, the events often are trivial. They just like deduct something from my account, but all the checks that are applied uh, to get to this conclusion, that's where often the errors are. Yeah, and also the idea that you can just go to share nothing architecture, you have Kafka and, and, and some distributed Mongo some store somewhere. Uh, in theory, we thought that would be possible, but the problem is that once you have share nothing architecture, you don't have a total store order of events anymore, and then you, the reprocessing of events will not result in the same result as it would have if you had replied the order in your first run, right? The moment you distribute uh, an event store, you lose the ability to tell which event came first. Because even if you timestamp it, you will have asynchronousities. And, and with automated systems, timestamps can be very close. So if the events are just a bit off, then you can have something happening uh, before um, another event that was already processed uh, from another shard. So share nothing architecture only works if you can shard your data in the first place. And then you don't need share nothing architecture because then you could just do regular sharding. This is basically the big takeaways that we have learned uh, in years of event sourcing, right? All right, so uh, this is the base idea we had and the, the conclusions we made over the, the years. And the rest of the talk now, I want to go through a bit of um, the command sourcing approach that we have made uh, happen to implement 
uh, that for tax law way. So uh, why, why did we choose command sourcing? Uh, all the registers in Norway are fairly old. Uh, Folky register is a, an old IBM mainframe, which gives you nice files that look like that. And they are uh, gigabytes and gigabytes. Um, so basically, the um, DB2 um, application that's running there is storing uh, a, a fixed offset file where every line uh, represents uh, a command in a way or a change made in the, in the registry. And um, what we do, we basically know this is the ID, the Fetzel's number of someone, the, the birth or the, the citizen ID or the, the foreign ID. And this is some uh, code that represents what the change is. And then depending on the code, all the other fields that are coming have a certain meaning. Right? So this is the name, obviously. This can be um, uh, the commune number. Uh, this is then something that doesn't, isn't filled out or it's missing data. Right? We have all this. So all we do is that we split this file into rows, more or less, and we take it as it is in an XML file and put it into the event store. Because we have made many, many mistakes processing this file already. And you can imagine if we had just changed the application state and persisted the results as events, then mistakes that we have made wouldn't be easy to correct because we would have to send corrections for every error processing that we've done in the past. And mistakes can be trivial. Mistakes can be encoding issues because the system that we work with has also has mistakes, it has bugs. Sometimes the, the encoding of one line doesn't re, uh, equal the encoding of another line. So it can be as trivial as that we have lose a letter. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you have lost this information, uh, correcting it is, is not um, easy. And the thing is with event sourcing that once you have millions of events and you don't know if these events are actually representing the truth, correcting an event store that is full of bad data is almost impossible. So once you get your event store into a bad state, basically your whole production system uh, will not function anymore and it's, it's not easy to correct it either. Right. So um, since we have all that, and uh, bear with me, there's, there's a very nice property of storing the commands um, as events. Uh, we can then extend basically on every line, uh, every event that we have, and then we can basically consolidate these, this information into um, enriched data, where not only the events are, but which are the snapshots. So every time we get a new row, um, we, we basically update the snapshot, and the change to the snapshot we persist back as events. So for example, the ID uh, system that captures a birth number and gives you a so-called parts number, which is your tax ID, is then this conclusion is then written back to the event store. So we both have the input and the output in there. And this gives us an event store that captures uh, changes in, in the source systems, right? And uh, every such event will get a sequence number. And this is a big decision uh, we had to make. Uh, we have one central event store which obviously doesn't scale in writes. Um, but you have to go through this event store, and every event that will uh, get in there will get a total store number. And then having these total store numbers, we can create representation snapshots and make them queryable, either so you can look up someone by his tax number, right? But you can also look someone up uh, with his tax number and the sequence number of the event. So anybody who listens uh, at the event store can basically say, go to a to microservice and ask the application, tell me how does this taxpayer look to you at sequence number one, or at sequence number two, or three. And they will get different results depending on. And that is crucial in an asynchronous system where services have to talk to each other. Not a single service knows um, how someone looks like. And I mean, imagine that you have a system where you try to query five services to build a tax card, right? You want to know um, what the person's name is, obviously, and the addresses. You want to know what the status is of uh, other, uh, of, of children, of, of a partner. You want to um, query information about uh, old, old tax data, right? And you have to ask all these different services, give me this information. Then all these services will have a different amount of events processed because they run asynchronously and you will get different answers from different services. So one service might still not have processed this latest message that tells uh, this, the, the, the application, OK, this person got divorced, so you have to treat them differently. The other service might not know that yet, so you get a different answer. 
And this was in the beginning not regulated at all and just was a big mess because then the debuggability goes away entirely because you check something and of course it's right, but at the time of querying you got an entirely different answer. So we wanted to have immut immut immutable APIs that can give you um, an answer that will never change, right? So as mentioned, if you ask this one service for information and the other uh, service for relation data, then you would normally go to one service and query it, give me the relations for, for this uh, ID, right? And then you'll get back an answer. For example, this is a company, and the owner of the company is that person. So you want to text that person, right? Uh, <coughs> but as mentioned, the, the uh, relationship service is typically the one that's lagging behind the most because it's the most complex. It only has processed event number two, while um, the information service already has processed event number three. To avoid inconsistencies, all services will always answer in a header what was the last sequence number I have observed. And then you can take this number and go to the next service and tell, say, give me the information for this ID at sequence number two. And you will get a consistent snapshot through all services. You can also then debug that and, or write it down somewhere, right? And if you have to look into what went wrong at a state, you can look up what the state was at sequence number two in all services. You can replay all events to sequence number two to see how a service has concluded with a snapshot. And that gave us this property that we originally wanted that we can actually look into things, right? It also goes the other way around. Let's say now the, relation, uh, the relationship service has arrived at event number three, but the information service has only arrived at event number two. Um, now you will get uh, basically a sequence back that uh, the service that gives you information about that ID doesn't even have yet. But since you present the service the sequence number you expected to know, it can now just basically tell you, wait a minute, I'm not there yet. Um, wh ask me again in a few minutes, maybe then I've processed that event, right? And doing so, all services in, in, in Scottetart now can basically request information uh, in its immutable state and across services get the right snapshot um, without being bound together. The price we pay, as said, is that we have this uh, centralized event store where all writes have to go through. We can scale reads fairly well because we can replicate the database by just reading the events and writing it to another database, right? And then we read from there because it will just be a mirror. But the writing has to go through one global, um, basically, lock. But for us, this works really well. And I think for most people, uh, most people have to scale reads and not writes, right? It also gives us really nice, consistent monitoring. This is a, um, an example of how it looks at Scottetarten. And here we see that we have 44 million events processed, and all services have arrived at the last event. Because we can ask each service, which is the last event you've successfully processed, and give us the ID. Then we can compare it with the event store, and we know everything's up to date. We can also keep track in, in Prometheus pretty easily and, and see when things went up to date, when events came in, when changes were made, and have it pretty basically a pretty good insight into what happens without us even knowing what these applications do. Anybody can come and, and register them at the event store, just publish this, this metric about what number you've observed last and adhere to this API um, conventions and, and work together uh, in, in the entire system of, of microservices. The best feature or property that we derived from that, however, was the possibility to correct errors. But I, yeah, exactly. Now, also, um, sorry, I, uh, this first. Um, one important property in, uh, we have is that we have to protect user data, obviously. Um, you can think that uh, Scatterdaten has a lot of sensible data, so you d we don't want to spread it around as much as we, as we would. So instead of making a copy of the information you received, thanks to these immutable APIs, all you have to store is a coordinate, right? If you have the ID and the sequence number, you know that you can fetch this, um, this result again and again without having a new database. And if you spread around addresses and, and um, names and everything to all different kinds of stores, we would eventually make a mistake somewhere and leak the data out. By avoiding that, we can just have a thin feed that is processed by everyone, which just says, we have this person um, being changed at sequence one. 
So if you want to know what happened, you get like a, an explanation, like I, I moved, right? If you're interested in the information, you can take this coordinate and look up the, the, the picture of that person at this exact sequence number only on demand. That way we avoid that unnecessary requests are made that basically data is sent over the wire, personal data is sent over the wire, unless it really is necessary, right? Also, we can basically um, detect if a mistake was made, then you can um, basically look that up. And now I get to what I wanted to say. This allows you also to introduce revisioning. Um, because uh, if you have made a mistake, for example, we, we had this silly encoding issue, what we do is that we uh, reprocess for one service all commands that led to these decisions, right? And we basically make a, we basically just fix the error in the code and we redeploy the application. Old events that were, however, already processed will, of course, remain in the broken state. So what we can then do is that we trigger reprocessing, but we don't rewrite the events. We just compare the old results that we have stored, the old aggregate store states. We compare them to the new aggregate states at every step. In our case, it's just JSON, so we make a JSON diff. If the JSON diff is the same, we just discard it, we say nothing changed. But if um, we detect that the new version that we deployed came to a different conclusion, instead of overriding the old state, we uh, detect that it exists and we publish it with a revision number. So every, every um, state ha starts in version one, but every time we update it, we add basically a new property, and a, new, um, a new run number for this revision and say, all right, we have updated it. And again, this we can publish on a feed, right? We can just say, nothing has changed, but we've made a mistake before. If this mistake is relevant to you, you probably also have to fix yourself. And the good thing with this is that it's all automated, right? We just have code that processes events coming in and generates new events coming out. We can run this code either in, in a mode where it publishes new information, or we can run it in a mode where we compare these results and instead of persisting it back to the event store, we compare it to the old conclusion we've made. So any mistake that we make, we can just fix it, deploy it, run through the entire state and compare by just diffing uh, if something has changed. We don't have to understand the mistakes even. With regular event sourcing, I don't know how I call it maybe, um, you don't have this property. If you publish events that are incorrect, you have to go in and basically correct these events manually. And if you have millions and millions of events, you don't have a chance of doing that. So we don't, if we make a mistake, we don't have to an analyze uh, what systems this reached, what consequences this have. We just have to publish a new version, deploy it, and it will self-heal in a way. How much time I have left? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. All right. I <laughs> um, yeah. I, if you ever saw any of my talks, you know that I never finish my slides, and it won't happen today either. <laughs> right. Um, this is already the short version, so because <laughs> it's 45 minutes, not one hour. Right. Um, so wh what do we have in the end? We have an event store, and we have services that read commands that were published as events in the event store. Then these services write results back to the event store, and if a mistake happens, then we just recover from these mistakes by reprocessing all commands and writing corrections back to the event store. All of these events can then be read by a thin feed that just informs all dependent services about the changes that were made, and they can do the same thing, right? So because that's why we unified the model. Commands uh, that come from the outside generate events, but events also generate events. So by basically treating everything as event, you have a full circle from the original input to the final output, right? Yeah, so we have the self-healing uh, property and we have full overview of what happens in the application, right? Okay. Uh, one thing I, I want to get through, uh, despite the little time we have, is deleting events, because that's also something we haven't seen supported by many um, event stores that you can get out there. And um, why would you delete the events? That's maybe the first question, because if you talk to event source people, then they say, uh, yeah, basically space is free, right? So why, why delete anything, which isn't true, if you ever got an Amazon AVS bill. Um, and, and, but there's very good reasons to do 
First of all, you want to delete events, as said. If you have millions of events, this can result in gigabytes and terabytes of data that is just lying around. At some point, maybe you want to crop these, this data, so you want to support it. Uh, you should delete data, because uh, especially if someone gets hold of our data store, you know everything about no the Norwegian population. You know where everybody lives. Um, you know where um, what people have earned, and you can access parts of this information in Norway anyways, um, but still, to have like such a big data set and can crawl in it, that's, that's a, a bad thing to, to give out. And obviously, we have people that enter witness protection. We don't want to have their addresses lying around, right? Um, which is also, also one reason that we have all these thin feeds, that this information is not like crossed around uh, in just a battery that just fetches everything and selects out the data they want. And since the GDPR, obviously, you have to. Uh, the GDPR doesn't apply as much to Scott the Tartan since we are a, a, a government uh, entity, but it still uh, requires us to, to delete data if you really don't need it. Mm. And if you have left Norway 10 years ago, why should we still keep around all of your data, right? Um, you would like this data to be erased, so we had to uh, think about supporting that as well. Right. The problem is, with an event store, you never know uh, what state uh, applications are. So what we do is that we send a Thumbstone event. If a Thumbstone event is sent, then the event store deletes all um, events that are registered on the same ID. But now we already have replicated the information in the information services out there, right? So they will receive the Thumbstone and then just delete all aggregates for the Thumbstone. As you can see, we haven't deleted all personal information there. Your citizen ID is still in the event store. And this is actually a mistake I think many people make when designing event stores. You want to have some good identificator. So in Norway, typically, everybody takes a citizen ID or a foreign ID as the primary key in the database already. Once you do that, you will never get rid of this, because the information to delete something on a key includes the key. So ideally, you have some mapping over from uh, the key to a hash, at least, um, in a one-way function that you can delete it. We don't have this property even in Tax Norway. Then again, the citizen IDs are our identificator. We issue them so we can use them. But I, I'd recommend you, in any application, avoid using these sort of things as an, a primary key for your, for your uh, entities, because you, otherwise you will not be able to get rid of them. Uh, a second thing we do is compaction. So if we don't need old data anymore, but we still need the current state of the data, basically we take all old events, we compute um, the current state that is um, currently valid, and then we publish a new event that is a compaction um, at the state of, of three, right? And then we say, like, if you ask for older information than three, this is the state we still know. We mark it, we say this is not the real state you have observed, but we deleted the old state for um, purposes of, of data protection and um, saving space. Uh, just use the state, it's okay from our side, right? Then obviously uh, you cannot do this if you still need the old data, but again, if it's like too many years back, uh, we can do it and, and avoid having a lot of stuff lying around, right? So this is perfectly possible in, in a simple event store that you can implement yourself. And um, it's, it's, not, it's not really difficult either, and it works quite well. Yeah, so, right, this, this old entity would then be represented at the current entity, but with a, with a tag that this is not the actual state. And as I mentioned, uh, now I think I'm <laughs> really over the limit. Um, <coughs> I, the slides are online. The implementation is super simple, and I still hope that we can open source it. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to find out who I have to bother to, to get this done. Um, but yeah, it, it works quite well. But there's obviously a lot of solutions out there, but we just build it in Java and on the Oracle database, and it scales quite well uh, for our purposes, at least. I think in the enterprise, you don't have these multi-billion event things, then you have to go to Kafka and to losing data and, and buy these degrees of freedom that I mentioned in the beginning. Right, so three minutes, right. Then let me think what I want to talk in these three minutes, right. Yeah, so basically this is our API. We have an event. Event has a, a sequence number, uh, which is null if uh, zero if it's not yet persisted. It has a, s a unique identificator to identify the, uh, the event um, by its a name, sort of. It has an ID, which is the, 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 the text number or the, the birth number. 
a type, which is basically just an XML namespace, and, and a value, which is the XML of, in this namespace. Then an event store in our case is just an interface with two methods. One is read, you get back a stream. The other one is, is write, and you get a, a consumer where you can just dump events in. Internally, it's batched and sent over to the store. And if you want to write a new uh, software that, that processes the events from the event store, the code in, in the bottom is basically what you have to write. That's all the boilerplate. That way, you can read it and publish it back. Right? And that's, of course, a, a dumb implementation because it's just rewrite. This is basically an endless loop, and people do that as well, so please catch those. Um, but yeah, that's all it takes. And we can implement that as an SQL event store, as an in-memory event store, or an HTTP event store. So we can either persist it locally in memory in the test or uh, and on, a, on a foreign uh, event store that's uh, reached via HTTP, right? The base just has a simple table where we write stuff in and uh, put, dump it in. It gets this next sequence number. We have to lock the table. Otherwise, sequence numbers aren't atomic. Otherwise, you will have them switched around. And that's it. That's basically the event store we built, and it works really, really well for us. Yeah, you have to make sure that you give an index hint here, because Oracle or da SQL databases aren't happy with tables that are empty and then fill up really quickly. It will use the statistics from the, the empty table and say, all right, what's the most efficient way of accessing the table? Obviously, the table is empty. According to statistics, I'll do a full table scan and with millions of events, and then everything breaks down, right? Yeah. So I think all this we don't do anymore. We can mention testing. Testing, obviously, is super easy with event sourcing. I'd say this is the major benefit, because all you need to do is you spin up one application, you publish the events, and you expect events coming back. So you can write a really simple test framework that just basically sends events in and expects events back. And that's your, your general assertion. So in the integration tests get super, super easy. Um, to write because all you have to do is to, to access this, this singular uh, event API. Right? So you push something in and you get something out. All the ecosystem around it, all the integrations, you don't have to spin up. You don't have to mess around with test containers and, and Docker. You just spin up the application and a simple event store and, and you get what you want to know. All right. So as mentioned, I, I don't. I don't get through my slides ever, <laughs> but uh, if you're interested in the matter, I'm here until the afternoon. Just come to talk to me. I'm Raphael. Thanks for joining me. This is some of my open source software. I hope you have time to check it out at some point as well. And I'm still here for questions, I guess. I have time for questions. Are, are there any questions? Please ask me. Are you sure? <laughs> no, I mean. And then, uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>